Hi everyone, welcome back. This is Wilfred Manzano again, one of the Stanford Radiology resident doctors. Today, I'll be discussing the sternum and sternoclavicular joints. We will review normal anatomy of these structures and then discuss a variety of pathologies listed here in a case-based format. The clavicle articulates at the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints. The latter topic, along with the scapula, will be discussed in future videos. Let's start with the anatomy. The sternum is composed of three parts, the manubrium, the sternal body, and the xiphoid process, which resembles the tip of a sword. The sternum is difficult to visualize on a true frontal radiograph because of multiple overlying structures. As a result, a dedicated view of the sternum requires oblique positioning, as outlined here. Check out this comparison study, wherein median sternotomy wires nicely outline the border of the sternum. Let's discuss several important landmarks. The first is the sternal angle at the manubrio-sternal junction. Next is the jugular notch, a palpable landmark at the base of the ventral neck. The first costochondral junction articulates entirely with the manubrium. This chondral structure is where the costoclavicular or rhomboid ligament attaches. In contrast, the second costochondral junction straddles the manubrial sternal joint. The third through seventh ribs directly articulate with the lateral aspects of the sternum. This contrasts with the false eighth through tenth ribs and the floating eleventh and twelfth ribs. The lateral view further highlights the three main parts of the sternum. It's also helpful for assessing the sharpness of the sternal angle and the anteroposterior contour of the sternal body. The clavicular notch is where the clavicle articulates with the manubrium. Dedicated radiographic views of the sternoclavicular joints involve frontal, right anterior oblique, left anterior oblique, and upshot views. The upshot or serendipity view is critical for alignment. The x-ray tube is angled 40 degrees cephalad and directed towards the clavicles. While radiographs may be helpful, CT provides the best initial characterization of these structures. We will highlight their appearance on CT and other modalities in the following cases. First case, is this a bony erosion? The cortical undersurface of the medial clavicle appears irregular. However, note it appears largely well corticated and scalloped. This is the rhomboid fossa, where the costoclavicular or rhomboid ligament attaches. Occasionally, the attachment site has a depressed appearance. Here's a CT companion. Note how the variant is not always symmetric. Next case, what are these findings? These are episternal ossicles located posterior to the superior border of the manubrium. Like any ossicle in the body, do not mistake these for acute trauma. Here's how they look on sagittal view. What is the significance of this finding? The sternal foramen is an incomplete fusion of the lower third of the sternal body. This is a young patient with an immature skeleton noted by additional unfused sternal segments. So possibly this may fuse into adulthood. The clinical importance is that this lucency may be falsely interpreted as a lytic lesion on radiographs. Also, blinded procedures, such as bone marrow extractions, may be consequential without knowledge of these variants, as the pleura or pericardium may abut the sternum. Here's how the foramen looks to most radiologists, as it is more visible on CT. In this pediatric patient, is there non-accidental trauma? There are multiple rounded densities projecting over the right cost over tubal joints. The left side is spared. What is your next step? Fortunately, a lateral view saves the day. These are simply sternal ossification centers, aka sternibrae. At least four may be present at birth with progressive fusion through teens and young adulthood. Here are 3D renderings of unfused ossification centers in two different adolescent patients. 
Next question. Is this a fracture? No, it's just the epiphysis of the medial aspect of the clavicle. Note symmetry with the contralateral clavicle. These fices are the last to appear in the late teens and are the last to close in the early to mid 20s. It's important to distinguish these from sternoclavicular joint dislocations discussed later. Name two surgical procedures to treat this condition. This is pectus excavatum, wherein dorsal sternal deviation leads to a narrowed anteroposterior diameter of the chest. Important clinical associations are mechanical cardiopulmonary issues due to a smaller thoracic ribcage. There are also associations with connective tissue disorders. Note the indistinct appearance of the right cardiac border on this AP chest radiograph, a common finding. Two surgical interventions include the Ravitch and the more minimally invasive Nuss procedure, whose horizontal metal bar is depicted here. Pectus excavatum contrasts with pectus carinatum seen here, wherein a widened chest AP diameter is due to anterior sternal deviation. There are associations with congenital heart disease and scoliosis. Our next patient presents after trauma. Is the clavicular alignment normal? Remember one needs an upshot view, or better yet, a CT, if clinical concern is high for malalignment. Note the medial head of the left clavicle projects inferior to the right. Here is a 3D reformat of a subsequent CT. This is sternoclavicular dislocation, particularly the posterior type. As seen here, the left brachiocephalic vein is also compressed by the displaced clavicular head. The mechanism is usually blunt trauma, whether it is a motor vehicle crash or athletic injury. The posterior variety is less common than the anterior one, but the posterior variety demands surgical intervention. The clavicle may compress the trachea, vascular structures, nerves, thoracic duct, and esophagus. Commonly associated mediastinal hematomas further increase mass effect. This is a different patient, also with history of chest wall trauma, and now with chest pain. How come? Our zoomed-in frontal radiograph is not too revealing. A follow-up CT reveals the answer. This is a costochondral junction fracture of the right first rib. Note how there are foci of gas tracking into this region. It is a commonly unrecognized cause of pain after trauma. The reason being is that this area may appear very heterogeneous, especially in elderly individuals. In our next patient, what is the traumatic finding and what is the mechanism of injury? The sternum is mildly subluxed posteriorly relative to the manubrium. No discrete fracture line is identified. The mechanism is via direct force onto the sternum, subluxing the sternum relative to the manubrium. In this companion case, what is the mechanism of injury? The lower sternum is displaced anterior to the upper sternum. There's also a mild compression deformity of L1. In contrast to the prior case, this reflects an indirect force of a flexion compression mechanism. This causes the lower sternum to be displaced anteriorly and is commonly associated with vertebral compression deformities. Whenever working up sternal fractures, make sure to look at the vasculature, trachea, and other mediastinal structures. Here, there's an ill-defined retrosternal hematoma. Moving on to the next patient, what is the underlying condition? There are flowing anterior syndesmophytes in the thoracic spine. The manubrial sternal joint is difficult to appreciate due to superimposition artifact. Sagittal CT better illustrates this area. The manubrial sternal joint is entirely fused. Also note the diffuse fusion of the thoracic vertebral bodies and ossification of the interspinous ligaments, giving a bamboo appearance. 
This patient had ankylosing spondylitis. Correlation with serum biomarkers further corroborated the story. Mandibular sternal joint fusion is commonly seen, but not necessarily pathognomonic. Other causes for fusion may be developmental or pagets. Next case. Describe the medial aspect of the right clavicle. This is a trick question because there is no clavicular head. Instead, there are multiple surgical clips in this region associated with surgical resection. Follow-up question. Well, why was it resected? The medial clavicle can be resected for a variety of reasons. There's a wide differential, with the most common being past trauma, infection, severe osteoarthritis, or neoplasm. Sternoclavicular osteoarthritis is common because it's the only synovial joint between the upper extremity and the trunk. Joint space narrowing, capsular hypertrophy, subchondral sclerosis, cystic change, and osteophytosis can be seen, like any other part of the body with osteoarthritis. If there is significant osteophytosis associated with the joint, patients may palpate a mass-like structure on exam, prompting further investigation. Our next case is one of documented septic arthritis. Septic arthritis is associated with IV drug use and may lead to fatal mediastinitis. On this radiograph here, note the indistinct appearance of the medial clavicle, suggesting concurrent osteomyelitis. The upshot view notes the erosion of the medial clavicle. If severe, there can be large capsular distension with extracapsular fluid and periarticular muscle edema. As a brief aside, CRMO and SAFO are commonly tested entities in the clavicles, falling under the umbrella of CNO, chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis. Some think these entities fall under a disease spectrum, differing in the age group affected. CRMO may affect children, while SAFO may affect adults. SAFO is associated with synovitis, acne, pustulitis, hyperostosis, and osteitis, as the name implies. What is your next step in this patient? The sternum again is difficult to see from overlying artifact, but note all the bones demonstrate increased density. Our next step is to get a CT. Here, there are diffuse sclerotic mets. Breast, lung, and prostate cancer are common primaries. Always keep a high index of suspicion for malignancy whenever you detect a sternal lesion. What is your next step in this case? The sternum is bowed outward, giving a pectus carnatum appearance. However, the manubrium and upper sternal body are expansile. The answer again is to get a CT. Sagittal CT shows the expansile nature and chondroid matrix in the sternum. This was chondrosarcoma, the most common primary malignant neoplasm of the sternum. Adults in their fourth through sixth decades of life are commonly affected. How about this case? What's your next step? This was a hard one. There is an ill-defined density overlying the left aspect of a thoracic vertebral body where there's a radiopaque BB marker. The lateral view shows the ill-defined density in the xiphoid process. CT again saves the day. Your diagnosis? Similar to the last case, this is a chondrosarcoma. It has a similar expansile nature in chondroid matrix. Definitely don't mistake these for just costochondral calcifications. For our companion case, are you concerned about these findings? In the region of the xiphoid process again, there is a well-corticated ossification. Unlike the last case, however, there is no osseous or chondroid matrix. This is heterotopic ossification. It's commonly seen near the xiphoid process, especially after surgical incisions. Note the median sternotomy wires here. Abdominal surgeries can also be associated as the rectus abdominis muscles attach to the xiphoid process. Our next patient has a history of prior treated lymphoma. What complication are you concerned for? 
A sagittal CT shows ill-defined sclerosis with an anteriorly displaced fracture of the upper sternum. Patients treated with radiation may lead to vascular compromise in the bones within the port field. Radiation osteonecrosis may lead to progressive sclerotic changes, cortical regularity, and eventually fractures. While the findings may mimic metastases, radiation osteonecrosis typically lacks the soft tissue component. In our next case, what has happened in the interval here? On our first radiograph, the sternal wires are nicely aligned and intact. A second one shows malalignment of the lower sternal wires. This is sternal dehiscence, defined as separation of the sternum. Sternal dehiscence is commonly seen in the early postoperative period with risk factors being diabetes, malnutrition, and infection. Migrated sternal wires may lead to displaced, rotated, or disrupted sternal fragments. Radiographic detection may precede clinical findings, which is why their identification is very important. The big concern is for associated infection in the mediastinum. Treatment requires revision, sternectomy, or muscle flap closure. All right, we're nearing the end. In this case, why is the manubrium thin? Here's the follow-up sagittal CT. This is a trick question because there is no manubrium. It's actually a sternal prosthesis. This surgery typically occurs after severe trauma, metastatic disease, or local invasion by cancer. Today, with the advent of 3D printing, 3D printed prostheses allow for improved cosmetic appearance and respiratory mechanics. All right, well that was our overview of the sternum and sternoclavicular joints. This was by no means a comprehensive overview, but hopefully you're now more equipped to tackle these structures. And remember that while radiographs may be helpful, CT provides the best initial characterization for these structures. See you next time.